The woman behind the counter started shrieking, oh my God, oh my God, you're from Project Runway. And I said, oh, thank you. I'm glad you've been watching the show. And she said, look, everyone, it's Michael Kors. <laughs> so I didn't correct her. She was so excited about Michael Kors. I didn't want to disappoint her. Can I just say something to the audience? I just have to tell you something. I have, I, this is so surreal for me to be sitting here. I'm out there all the time and marveling at, at Bud and his, his other guests. The fact that I'm sitting here, I mean, I, I, it's surreal. I don't really believe it. And thankfully the lights are such I can't really see you. So I'm gonna pretend you're really not there. Well, Tim, something's going on because all these people didn't make a wrong turn. <laughs> Thank well, you for coming. I'm really, I'm so honored to be here with you. So this is, I would assume, pretty much how you planned it. For all those years in academia, 25, 30 years, you, you pretty much had it down pat. You know, after 50, I'm gonna make a, like, a slight switch and I'm gonna walk down the street and people will know how I am across the country. That was all part of the game plan, right? Never, I mean, I talk about my serendipitous path and it was very serendipitous and, and no one's more shocked and surprised by all this than I am and I have to tell you, I pinch myself every day and think, when am I going to wake up from this incredible dream? Um, it's phenomenal for me, phenomenal. Now you were very influential behind the scenes in the fashion world, largely because of your job at Parsons. Yes. And then I'm always fascinated by transitions. All of a sudden, you're doing this show and you become a very public person. What was that transition like for you? Well, here I am with this pregnant pause. <laughs> um, can, can I back up for a moment to talk about the behind the scenes you know work what? for just a moment? You could, with this crowd, I bet, do anything <laughs> you'd like. Because I, I have to tell you, when I, um, I've been at Parsons for, was it 18 years before I landed in the Department of Fashion Design, and I'd had a lot of different roles, but for the 12 years prior to being chair of the Department of Fashion Design, I was associate dean. And in that capacity, I worked with all the departments at Parsons, and I, um, oversaw, well, I actually practiced curriculum development. I oversaw the appointment of full-time faculty and department chairs. I worked with the development of our programs abroad. It was a very, very academic role that didn't allow me to engage very much with, uh, with many people. Um, we had a crisis in the Department of Fashion Design, and it, I'll summarize it briefly by saying that the program was suffering from dormancy. <laughs> for, for 50 years, the curriculum had remained unchanged. And the effect of that for the students was a, a, a serious questioning about what am I doing here and a, and a serious erosion of morale. So I arrived at the department intending to conduct a, a search for a new department chair and uncovered this very in need of love and care situation that anyone coming in off the street would probably require, I don't know, at least two or three years to really understand. And having been at Parsons for so long, I did understand it. Mm -hmm. So I had been there for about, had been in the department for about three months and I said to the dean, this is not a one year appointment, which the appointment had intended, he had intended for it to be because he wanted me back in his office. I said, the place is hemorrhaging and it needs serious attention and even once we prescribe a new curriculum, it requires implementation. And the culture here is such that it's going to push back on all of that. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because I was not a friend to the fashion industry. As a matter of fact, I was um, held up as being someone who was tearing down the American fashion industry by making these changes at Parsons. Um, I, in, in the beginning of the implementation, uh, which was in the fall of 2001, which in a way was a kind of metaphor, I hate to say, um, I was called to an emergency meeting at the dean's office, which was down in the village. The fashion department is up in the fashion district, uh, 7th Avenue and 40th Street. So I went running down and there in front of me were the president of the CFDA and four top designers in the city, each of whom, or collectively, they were there to tell the dean get rid of that man, he's a bad influence. He's doing bad things to this industry and we want him out. 
So my knees were shaking, I was quivering, and the dean said to me, well, I brought Tim Gunn down here because I wanted him to hear me tell you that I stand behind him and that I support what he's doing. And yes, it may seem terrible to you right now, but just give him some slack and, let, and see what will happen. So this is all building up to the first senior year presentation of Runway Show of this new curriculum, which was in the fall, was, I'm sorry, which was in the spring of 2002. And you may be wondering, how could you implement this curriculum in fall of 2001 and have a senior year in 2002? The place was so, um, it, it was in such terrible shape that we couldn't phase in curriculum, which is what you would normally do, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, oops, sorry. See, even I got excited about this. <laughs> we needed to do it quickly. And again, a little tiny anecdote. The thing that was so controversial in the industry was that I took the jewel in the crown of the department, a program called the Designer Critic Program, and I hurled it out into 7th Avenue and said, hopefully some cabs will run over this. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. <laughs> but before I did that, I had to meet with the juniors who were rising because this program matched students. It didn't really match them. It just set them up with top designers in the city. People like Donna Karen and Mark Jacobs, um, two examples, would work with a group of anywhere from eight to ten students who would do a collect and they would do a single look that collectively would be a collection under that great designer's direction. So I went to the juniors who were rising into this experience to ask, you all may have come here for this. How would you respond if I told you that I wanted it to go away? And the reason I wanted it to go away was very clear. It was infantilizing. The students were graduating not knowing who they were. They were graduating not wanting to work for Donna Karen. They have a different sensibility, a different point of view, yet she's the one who guided them through this program. And as wonderful as that sounds, when you're that individual and you have a passion and you have something to express, it's not so great for you. So the juniors knew that the seniors were profoundly unhappy, really unhappy. And I knew that they were nervous about rising into this experience. So at any rate, I presented this to them and said, you vote. If you want this to remain, I'm going to talk, try to talk you out of it. But if you fight me, you may win. Well, they didn't fight me. They cheered. They applauded. They were on their feet. And I was thrilled on the one hand, but then I asked them, okay, I'm thrilled that you're happy about this, but don't you want to know what's going in its place? Because it's not going to be a year off. And I told them that they would be designing a collection, designing and making a collection of clothes that represents their point of view as, as a designer. And then they went crazier, more cheering, more screaming. They were thrilled. So I asked how many people in this room are terrified and a couple of hands went up. And I, they asked me why. And I said, because every hand in this room should be up. You should all be terrified. The reason being, you've been in a curriculum that's been preparing you for a very different experience, an experience that allows you, or that it, it nurtures you to be dependent upon these designer critics and the faculty. You, in this former construct, had no thought, no ability to think because you weren't, you weren't decision makers in this new construct, it's all in your head. And if you crash and burn, you crash and burn. There isn't anyone here to help pick you up. So they, we march forward, but against this great controversy, because since 1948, this designer critic program was in place at Parsons, and all these designers on 7th Avenue, and at that time, roughly 70% of the designers on 7th Avenue were Parsons educated, so they, this was, what they believed in, this is what they experienced. This was their own school of hard knocks, and they may have hated it, but it was part of the experience that was nostalgic for them. So I was removing this. So I was not popular by any means. And the night of that first show, Stan Herman, then the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, came up to me and he said, well, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> and I gulped. And I thought, who knows, maybe he's right. No, I didn't, actually I never said that. I believed in those students. I believed in it wholeheartedly and I thought, maybe it won't catch on this year, but it will eventually. So that show, I've never experienced anything like it my entire time at Parsons. It was the first time in my experience that we ever had a standing ovation after the show. People were on their feet. The following morning, 
the press wrote about the work of the students. They weren't writing about the party. That's all they ever did. You never heard about the work. You heard, oh, Donna Karen's collection went down the runway. That was it. You didn't hear what it was. And in this case, they were talking about these individuals. And Julie Gilhart from Barney's called and said, I want that finale collection, which was the Perenza Schooler collection. Um, and so th that phenomenon was born at that moment. So after the show, Stan came up to me, threw his arms around me, and he said, never go back. I never believed that these students were this talented and could achieve this level of work. And uh, that was a moment for me that I still remember very emotionally, and it was a turning point. And it was a turning point in some ways, and I don't want this to sound arrogant, it wasn't me, it was the students. It was a turning point for the industry because it was the launching of a fervor for um, young entrepreneurial designers. The, the Perenza Schooler boys were a kind of threshold, and since then, it's continued. In fact, it's accelerated. Um, and I really believe we were very responsible for it. Not singly responsible, but, but we were there at the right time in the right place. And that was the beginning, in a way, of my own transition. Because when the Project Runway producers called in January of 2004, we were well underway with this curriculum, still being fine-tuned. I mean, it still is. Things should never become stagnant. They should always be under review and assessed. And would you ever say about anything, it can't be better? I don't think so. Whatever it is, it can be better. Um, there may be a few exceptions in art, but, but very, very few. So, so I'm, but please, I'm babbling. That's I told okay. you this would happen. That's okay. I that babble. That's okay. Yeah. Look, Stop the, me. The, the Parsons story is an important story, obviously. It, well, yeah. it, it is an important um, story. There's Thank a you. famous story that Liz Smith, the grand dame of gossip, tells about herself that she was a freelance writer doing pretty well in the mid 70s when the Daily News first offered her a. Um, a column, gossip column, she says she turned it down and she told them that gossip was dead. <laughs> right? And she later went, then went on to become, I think, the most highly paid newspaper writer in the country, so gossip wasn't quite so dead. I raise it because I understand when you had the first meeting with the Project Runway people, you basically said to them, and I'm paraphrasing here, I'm not sure this thing is going to fly. Well, it even happened before the meeting. They called me, I still remember this vividly, because I was horrified when they told me what they wanted to do. Um, <laughs> it, it was J Jane Lipsitz and Dan Cutforth, and they called and they, they, they were on the phone together and they said, we have this great idea, we want to run it by you, we're talking to people all over the industry, and what do you think? Well, what is it? And they said, we want to do a reality show about fashion design, and I'll tell you exactly what I said. I said, this industry is in enough trouble without that. <laughs> And I think I said it just like that, too. Um, are there any other predictions you'd like to tell us about? <laughs> that, you know, Truman beat Dewey. You know, that's, right. Well, so go ahead. I, I mean, thank God for Google. I Googled Jane and Dan, and I found out that they were the Project Greenlight producers. So I thought, ah, oh, they have an integrity, they have a seriousness of purpose. I, I thought, okay, th these are people I'm pleased I'm going to meet with, because I, in the end, I agreed to the meeting. So they came in. And I had been with them for about five minutes, and they revealed that they wanted to work with real fashion designers. So I was instantly placated. I thought, this, this is good. Um, and then I, got, I became very excited about what they wanted to do and, and about their ideas. And keep in mind, they were looking for a consultant. My role on the show was in no one's vocabulary. It never came, I mean, it just wasn't even in the ether. So. I was getting excited about the whole possibility of working with them in this capacity, and, and, and you alluded to this in, in your introduction. They asked me uh, what I just de detected to be a very important question. The question being, how would you respond if we were to tell you that we want the designers to design a wedding dress in two days? And I shrugged, and I said, they'll have to design a wedding dress in two days. <laughs> I said. This is what I say in my classes is a make it work moment. So, <laughs> and they looked at each other very meaningfully and I, I asked, did I give you the wrong answer? 
And they said, no, 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 it's that you're the only person we've spoken to who said this can be done. And I said, but wait a minute, let me qualify my statement. It's not going to be an Oscar de Laurenta gown, it's not going to be Vera Wang, it's not going to be Nicole Miller, it's going to be a very basic sleeveless column. I hope you understand that. <laughs> so it, that was quite a moment. I should also tell you, when they called a few days later and said, we, we want you to do this, we want, we want to work with you, I was ecstatic. And we worked together for about four months before heading off to the auditions, and that's when my role came up. But I have to tell you something funny, because we had a big, serious debate. And the debate was, someone planted in their heads when they were going around doing all these interviews, that the designers didn't have to make the clothes. That we could have a sample room that would have pattern drafters and seamstresses and tailors, and that they would execute the design work. And I said, wait a minute. If the audience doesn't see the designers getting literal and metaphorical blood all over their hands, no one's going to believe this. And who does Heidi send home? The pattern drafter? <laughs> so I'm happy to say I won. <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> How is she? Oh. <laughs> you know, the wonderful thing about being a, a kind of spokesperson for the show and in, in, in when we're meeting like this, Bud, is that I really don't have to pretend that I love and adore her. I love and adore her. And I have to tell you, she is so funny. She's so smart. All you really need to know is that the crew loves her. And the crews don't lie. They, they are, an, they are a, a great barometric gauge of what's going on. And I know you would know how gorgeous she is in print and how gorgeous she is on, in, in, on television. She is breathtaking in person. She really is breathtaking. And there was one uh, moment when, it was actually the season three reunion show, and I had her hand in mine, and I looked, at her, I looked up at her, and I said, Heidi, even your knuckles are gorgeous. <laughs> and they are. Is there a moment from, during the course of the first season or second season, a moment away from the show, not while you're doing the show, taping the show, when for the first time it dawns on you, something's going on here. This is different. During the taping of the, of the first season? But honestly, it, it, it didn't then. And, I, and I'll, tell, I'll tell you what was going through my mind during the first season. First of all, when the producers asked me whether I would be interested in this role, working with, well, mentoring the designers in the workroom, I thought to myself, I know why they're doing this. They are afraid that if we give the designers a challenge, send them into the workroom, no one's going to talk. So by sending me in to, to probe and poke and ask questions, it will elicit dialogue. But I also thought, while we were taping, no one needs to hear my voice. No one needs to even see me. All that they really need is the designers responding to what I'm asking. And I was absolutely confident that I would be out. I would not be in at all. And it's why, you may have heard me say this before, it's why I didn't go to the, pr the premiere party. I, I thought, if I'm, and, and this is where I, I display that I have some ego. I thought, if I'm not in the show, I'm gonna be deeply humiliated. <laughs> and if I am in the show, what in God's name am I gonna look like? I ha never saw a, a rough cut. I never saw anything before the show actually aired on television. So I watched the show the way I used to watch The Wizard of Oz as a kid. I was under the sheets of my bed, pinking out. <laughs> I was. It was really season two when I began to feel it. And I'll also add that after season one began to air, there was, oh yeah, there was some love, but there was some snarkiness, particularly in the fashion industry, um, about, oh, that show's cheapening our industry and it's, it's um, not portraying it the way it really is and, you know, it, workrooms aren't like that. And I thought to myself, well, you know, it feels an awful lot like Parsons. I mean, even though it's taped at Parsons, it feels right. like the situation at Parsons very, very much. And I think that what was difficult for the industry in general was that we ripped that veil of mystery right off of the fashion industry. And we said to people, this isn't so glamorous. This is dirty, gritty, daunting, extremely difficult. And if you want to sign up for this, you better have the chops to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a matter of, oh, some elves design this work and it <laughs> appears on a runway and you accept a big bouquet of flowers and you fly off to Rio for a vacation. 
Um, I mean, as soon as that runway show is over, pow, you're designing your next collection. Actually, that's not even true. There are, there are several seasons happening simultaneously. So I, I say this because when we were wrapping up season two, it was, the, the designers were already gone, the crew was, and the producers and I were wrapping things up. It was about three days after the, the designers had left. I remember the day, it was Bastille Day. It was July 14th. <laughs> because it was the day that they were announcing the Emmys. And we were nominated for season one. And I thought, take that fashion industry. Mm. Anyone who doubts the quality of this show there it is. There we go. were nominated for an Emmy, and the only non-network show nominated, which was quite phenomenal. Thank you. And we've been nominated every year since. We just need to win. <laughs> that amazing race needs to stop racing. Yeah, that's right. It's true. <laughs> and you see the designs on that show? <laughs> Stripes with whatever. <laughs> uh, when watching Tim Gunn's Guide to Style, what intrigues me is where is the line? In your own mind, in your own heart, where is the line when you're talking to these people, when you're initially offering criticism, and then you come through with, you know, you're, you're something to the effect of you're better than this, you're, you're building them up. The back and forth, the give and take. Is it something that is, is, is conscious to you, or is it just like a feel thing? Um, that's a great question, Bud. I, I think it's a little bit of both. You, you have to feel the moment, even when you know something is, is supposed to happen. And, and I have to tell you, I would not have done Guide to Style, the show, um, because it comes from the book that I, had, I did that came out last spring, spring a year ago. Um, well, it's not spring yet, so it was last spring. Shut up, Tim. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have done the show if the show had been an intervention. I really don't believe in that. If, if the women with whom we worked hadn't raised their hands and said, I need help, I'm in a fashion rut, I would never have entered their home because I don't believe in that. I, I mean, it's my refrain in the show. I can't want you to succeed more than you do. So in working with these women, and they were each of, of whom was really extraordinary in her own way, I could say to them when it became incredibly difficult and she would doubt whether she really wanted to go through with it, I could say, you know, if it's that hard for you, you called me. We don't have to do this. We can call the whole thing off. You can go back to New Jersey with your cargo capri pants and your tank tops. <laughs> go back. It's fine. But now, you, called, you called me. Now, now I, have a, I have a thing. <laughs> And, and in that case, Nicole just happened to be from New Jersey. It yeah. could have been anywhere. Yeah. So it's not, a, not about New Jersey. Now, now, about the Capri Pants thing. Um, when I was growing up in the 60s, uh, Laura Petri on the Dick oh. Van Dyke show was, well, I don't want to get too personal here, but I was fond of her. She, no, okay. She, she, so. Laura Petri, Mary Tyler Moore, stunning, great figure, dancer. If you have the right physique, you can pull it off. Okay. And, and so you'd, you'd be okay with her with the Capri pants? Absolutely. I mean, look at the exceptions. Because I might have to leave the room if you say <laughs> No. <laughs> Laura Petri, Jackie Onassis right. can do it. Um, uh, Babe Paley, most of you were too young to even know who Babe Paley is, but a serious fashion icon because in, in the 50s and 60s, okay. when, when, when she ruled, um, they were really all the, the Capri pants were all the rage and they were new. Mm -hmm. um, but w with the right physique, you can do it. But it's like any item of fashion. You need to know your body type. You ne need to know um, your own silhouettes and proportions and then understand which silhouettes and proportions work for you. I can never and would never offer up fashion prescri prescriptions, ever. I don't believe in them. You can't say, oh, well, everyone, if any, everyone wears this, they'll be fine. I mean, I do have my 10 essential items, but it's not... A trench coat is not a trench coat is not a trench coat. You personalize it. It's whatever you want it to be. I mean, people say, oh, I don't like, you know, trench. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, bohemian. I wouldn't wear something classic like that. Well, you can get very bohemian with a trench coat. I mean, hmm. if you look at um, uh, Valentino's red patent leather trench for last fall, it was gorgeous and the antithesis of a Burberry trench. So personalize it. 
Now, one of the things I'm intrigued by on the show is when you take these women and you pick them out and all of a sudden they're shopping in places where I think it's safe to say they would not ordinarily be shopping and, or hadn't been shopping previously. Um, and it struck me watching the show that it's ostensibly about clothes, but it's about a lot more. It is. Uh, so my question is, is there a lesson to be learned or something that someone who is not in the position while watching the show to go out the next day and shop on Madison Avenue at a place where they had, from a financial standpoint, no right to shop? Can they glean something from the show knowing that the next day they're not, like the people on the show, going to go to a place that they had never been before? Well, I know what you're referring to when we take them to a designer. Right. Because our, most of our shopping happens at Macy's, which uh -huh. is pretty accessible yeah. to, to most people. Um, and that's exactly why we use Macy's, and that's why we don't talk about a budget, because you figure it's Macy's. It's, it's, you, we don't, it's, it's not going to be a $5,000 dress. But we do have the designer experience, because we want, we want to, I, I wanted to give her something special. I wanted her to meet someone who's passionate about their work, and mm -hmm. for that individual to share with her why that is. So, and, and, and it helped. Uh, it helped create the epiphany that we really needed and wanted. We, we were looking for, I was looking for a moment when I really knew she got it. She got it. Because I, I felt with, with many of the women, we work with eight, they were paying a lot of lip service to me. It was like, okay, you want me to say this? But I could tell through their body language, through their posture, they hadn't transformed yet. It hadn't happened. And they have to do it to themselves. I can help nurture and guide them. Whoops. But I, I can't, I, I, I refuse to make decisions for them. Um, I will tell them that's not the right silhouette for you or not the right proportion. Mm -hmm. But I won't say, here, just put these things on and, and you'll be okay. Um, so for the people watching, if they, if they can develop, and, and, and some people have it, it's not that no one has it, but if they can develop a, a, a critical self-analysis about, okay, what do I really look like just in my underwear? What do I look like if I wear these items? Um, I also believe you can't just put on a top without the corresponding bottom, because it, it is all about the silhouettes and the proportions and the total look. It's also why I don't believe in evaluating clothes that aren't on somebody. I do red car carpet reporting for the Today Show. Um, I was just at the Oscars a couple of weeks ago, and I was already prepared for what people were going to say about my support for Tilda Swinton. Because um, people were saying, oh, she's wearing a black garbage bag, and And I said, you know, I think she looks like a knockout. And um, she was wearing Jean-Paul Gaultier, and she is a bohemian. She is not a conservative-minded person. She's not a classicist. And I thought, that is the dress she should be navigating on the, the red carpet in. And it's not about, would you put that dress on Sally Field? Are you crazy? Of course not. Um, but on her, it worked and it was believable, which is why um, when, when I hear women say, oh, you know, my friend wears these things and I'm going to get them, it's like, well, are you the same size, shape, and coloring as your friend? Because chances are they're not going to work for you in the same way. You mean people in the fashion industry would say something like, she looks like she's in a garbage yeah, bag? Yes. That, that is incredibly mean. <laughs> I can't believe that someone would say something like that. Now, what I find very intriguing about your story is, here's this man on TV, glib, uh, egregious, all these words, <laughs> wonderful vocabulary, and that you were, once were a stutterer. Oh, God. I, I, well, here I go. When I get nervous yeah. and or tired, I get you, you all You didn't stuttering. have to prove my point here. Um, I, I had a really debilitating stutter, and it, it um, affected my childhood. I mean, I, I'm saying adversely. I shouldn't say that because everything that we experience contributes to who we end up being. So I wouldn't take it away, but it was very, very painful and difficult at the time, and it caused me to not socialized, which is not to say I wasn't socialized, I just mm -hmm. preferred the company of adults. Um, and it just, it gave me a huge amount of, of insecurities and um, I, public speaking in, in school was just, I, I would rather have leapt out a window than do that, but I had to do it and it was just painful. Uh, so I, I had a very solitary childhood and um, 
it, it, but that also caused me to discover things that I wouldn't have, have discovered otherwise. And, and I became a, an, an avid reader and became obsessed with Lego, which was my passion, <laughs> um, and studied the piano seriously for 12 years. And, and that was a way of having a voice without speaking. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a lot. You also told me the story that when you were teaching at the school uh, in Washington, which is your hometown, uh, before you came to New York, that you, you would get so nervous oh. that you would actually be sick. Yes. I was... Would you, would you please recall that wonderful story I to will. us here now? I, I was um, a struggling sculptor, and, and to make ends meet, I was building architectural models for three firms in Washington. And a dear, wonderful mentor by the name of Rona Slade, who was the chairman of fine arts at a, at a uh, museum school in Washington, called me to ask me whether I would teach a class in three-dimensional design. And I was, I mean, it was Rona Slade. I thought, I wouldn't turn her down. How thrilling. And I said yes, and had um, a few months to prepare for it, and I did. And I met with her a number of times, working out uh, content and classroom methodology. And when the day came, I, oh, I got sick in the parking lot. I mean, I'll just tell you. And more than once, and thought, <laughs> well, this is going to kill me or cure me, but it's, mm. I'm not going to let it kill me. And then in the classroom, I, my knees, which I don't know whether any of you have experienced this. It's not a pretty sight or a nice feeling. My knees sh were shaking so profoundly that I had to brace myself against the wall just to keep from falling over. And this went on for, well, a couple of weeks. I mean, it got better. But I thought, kill me or cure me, kill me or cure me. It's, it's, it's going to cure me. And, and it, it did. Um, and what I, found, what I wasn't expecting to find in teaching was that it would be so wonderfully, holy, purging and cathartic in terms of my own creative juices, mm. because I eventually put my own artwork on the shelf to massive criticism from everybody, including my parents, about what are you doing, what are you talking about? This, we paid for all this education, we've done all this, and in the case of my, of my colleagues, well, how true are you really to this calling? And, and because fine artists are like, it's like some weird religious sect. Um, <laughs> so I say that with the greatest respect, that was my world for a long time, but it's a religious sect. Um, and, I thought, you know, it, I'm, I'm, gonna follow, I'm, gonna, I'm creating my own path, and I'm, and I'm not going to let people tell me it can't be done this way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a, I don't think I know if that's been a theme in my life, and the, and, and the more experience I have, the more maturity that I have, the more confidence I have that I can, and we all should, we can make our own path. We don't have to say, there's the cookie cutter, and you have to fit into that. And it's very liberating and really wonderful, and it's something that, that I just, I, I, I'm thrilled to share with anyone who wants to listen to it, because it, it's true for each of us. It really is. You know, I have the privilege and pleasure in my job of profiling interesting, influential New Yorkers, and uh, great stories, hopefully, uh, great, interesting people all, but there are some common themes that you'll see, uh, overcoming obstacles, and, and so on and so forth, but in the 140 or so that we've done, um, you're the only one that's had a father who worked for the FBI. Oh. Uh, that, when you read about someone's background, that kind of stands out. Wow. Uh, how, how, what did it mean in the house? How aware of it were you as you and your sister? And my sister, yes. I'm the sister. My sister's three years younger to the day. We shared the same birthday. And of course, for me, I thought, well, my parents, there was only one night a, a year. <laughs> so truly, that's what I thought. <laughs> Um, my, my father was a career FBI agent, um, and when he joined the Bureau, he was the youngest agent in, in their history at that time, um, coming out of a, a, a law degree. And he uh, was Hoover's, he, he began, in, he was in Newark, I think, for the first one or two years of his career. That must have been something. Um, <laughs> And then he was transferred to the Washington office, and he ended up being Hoover's right hand. Um, J. Edgar Hoover, if any of you even remember 
him. I mean, this was, I have to tell you though, just to set this up, this was an extraordinary man. At that time, the director of the FBI was not a presidential appointment. Um, J. Edgar Hoover served under five presidents, and he was there to stay. Hmm. And I still, well anyway, I won't go into how he died, but that's mm. a whole other matter. But my father was with the FBI for 26 years, and he was appropriately very, very, very quiet about everything. And he worked long hours, and um, uh, during the week, my sister and I never had dinner with him. And my mother would wait, it was very Rob and Laura Petrie, except that he wasn't Rob Petrie. <laughs> um, and my mother would wait to have dinner with him when he got home, usually around 9, 9.30. Um, and, and I'll also share with you on the whole topic of my, well, I don't even, I don't even know that you need to know this, but I'll just, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I mean, imagine, here's this FBI guy, um, and here's this firstborn who's building these fantasy buildings in his room out of Lego, <laughs> who's pounding out Mr. Frog is full of hops on the piano, um, <laughs> who's really interested in all things related to design, who gets um, a put-together castle for his birthday and starts designing clothes for the soldiers. <laughs> you know? And my father coached several of the uh, neighborhood sports teams, of w which his son didn't participate in. <laughs> because his son would be the last one picked and he'd run home crying. Um, so it was just, we had a very, we had a difficult relationship, but I will say this about him, um, and, and he, he passed about 12 years ago. I will say this about him, he was always there for me in a crisis, and I gave him a lot of crises, a lot. He was always there for me in a, in a way that I will never forget. With that in mind, can you tell us about the importance of swimming? Yes. Oh, you know, swimming was one of the things that really helped me earn respect for my peers. I, I, I was a serious competitive swimmer. And it's a sport that you can do alone. It's not, it doesn't, I mean, there are relays, which are teams, but I wasn't a relay person. And it's really clean and you don't sweat. <laughs> which appealed to me enormously. <laughs> I didn't like the locker room aspect, but you could avoid that. You really could. I was throwing pants over wet bathing suits all the time. Um, and it was something that I really did well. And I, I um, held some um, scholastic records for a while. I'm sure that no longer, it was God only knows how many years ago, decades. Um, but I, I, I loved it, and it helped really give me some confidence that I, that I needed. And, and I excelled in school, but that wasn't helping me with my peers. You know, getting, getting good grades on exams and, and having the English teacher call out to you that it was her best paper didn't help hmm. at all. But, but once you started excelling in swimming, didn't your father become a swimming coach? Yes, my father did. Thank you, Bud, because yeah. that would be my lead. And my father ended up coaching the team, and he was very proud, I have to say very proud, and, uh, and, and I, I loved it. It's great, great. We will do probably about, uh, I'd say 15 or 20 more minutes, and then we'll have uh, time for question and answer. But we're only up to 13 or 14. I have years to go. No, I'm kidding. Did I? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, meant I another, don't even want to revisit those days. I meant another day and 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> So if, if you could kind of step outside yourself and assess your fashion sensibilities when you moved from Washington to New York in the early 80s? In 1983. Okay. Um, how would you assess yourself? Well, I was point? a stodgy old frump. Um, in Washington, everybody ends up sort of assimilating a uniform of some kind. Um, all I have to say is thank God I wasn't on Capitol Hill. Hmm. Um, and, and I had one, and it was very boxy, ample suits. And um, I thought nothing of it. I mean, I th I'm, not that I th thought nothing of it. I thought I looked pretty good. I thought, well, this is appropriate for Washington, and it works. And coming to New York, 
was, a fa was my fashion epiphany. And it didn't happen overnight, it happened gradually. But when it did happen, it, it, it was a moment when I realized I had a kind of out-of-body experience looking at a street corner and seeing 40 people at that street corner, no two of whom were dressed the same, <laughs> and understanding that this is a city that accepts you for however you choose to present yourself. And I realized I could become I could, I could become enhanced. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm conservative and suddenly I'm going to become bohemian, but it was a matter of having a little more innovation and a little more of a modern edge to me, which I really wanted. Um, and wearing black. My mother still laments it. Um, <laughs> I didn't own anything black, except shoes and a belt. And just getting getting with the city and realizing you're a citizen of it. But my real fashion epiphany happened when I became chairman of the, of the Department of Fashion Design. And it didn't happen when I walked across that threshold in that role. It happened about 18 months into it. And actually, it happened with Diane von Furstenberg. She won't even remember this. But we had known each other before then. And I was then meeting with her in a new capacity. And I could tell by her body language, and especially a little twi quivering eye, <laughs> that she thought, I don't know that this is going to work for you in this industry, this particular look. And it's when I thought, I, need, I can't disappoint Diane. I have to do something about this. <laughs> and um, it, was th it was at that moment when I thought, this, is, this was my epiphany. How do I take someone who's basically very... Um, I won't say either, either traditional or conservative. I don't think I'm that, but I'm a classicist. How do you take someone who's a classicist and update them? What do you do? So my epiphany was a black leather blazer tailored just like a regular suit jacket, but in black leather. And I went out, out on a mission and I found it. But that was the solution. <laughs> How'd that work out? Um, it was, it was, I mean, it's a long story. I won't bore you with all that, but it was, it, it, it worked, and yeah. I still have it, and I wear it. I should have worn it tonight. <laughs> uh, speaking of transitions, going from working at Parsons to working at Liz Claiborne, um, I mean, the, 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 on, on the face of it, it, it would appear to be a transition from you're just kind of working on things in theory to no more theory. These right. things are going to be out there, and there's a bottom line, and there's profits, and so on. Uh, what's the transition been like? Well, actually, but in many ways, you've described it very aptly. That, that is, in many ways, what it's like. But I, what, I, what I want to say about it also is that I never intended to leave Parsons. I thought I would retire there. And I uh, had received a call from Bill McComb, CEO of Liz Claiborne, who said, we need to get to know each other. I'm the CEO of Liz Claiborne. You're the chairman of, of fashion design at Parsons. And, and Liz Claiborne and Parsons had done a lot of things together, including scholarship programs and internships. So I met Bill, and I was totally wowed by this guy. I thought, he's not cut from the same garmento cloth as the people I know in this industry. Mm -hmm. And actually, he didn't come from the industry, which I think was a very good thing. So he wasn't encumbered with all that, we can't do, we can't do, we can't do, or this is the way we have to do it. I just found it to be so incredibly dynamic and so visionary, and I thought, what a lucky company to have this incredible individual as the leader. And we'd been talking for about 45 minutes, and then he dropped this opportunity for me in my lap, and I, no one was more shocked than I was. And I asked him why. And he said, well, Liz Claiborne Incorporated is going through a huge number of changes. It's about to go through a huge number of cha changes. I know what you've achieved at Parsons. I know that you're comfortable with change. I know that you support it. I know that you could be a partner of mine in all of this. And I know you from Project Runway. And I have every reason to believe that that person I see on the show is really who you are. And I like the way you operate. I like the way that you, inter that you engage and, and, and interact with people. Um, so two months later, I was at Liz Claiborne. And I used to say about Parsons that it was the real world design school, and I would say it proudly, and in a way I still say it. 
And by that I mean that we look at design through a lens of commerce, and I'm very proud of that, and I think it's very American to do that. And when I got to Liz Claiborne, I'd only been there for about a week, and I thought, Parsons is the real world design school. I said, that place is in an academic bubble. Hmm. So um, it's very different when you have real deadlines and you have um, a bottom line, as you said, and you have stockholders. But the other aspect of this is that Bill brought me in to be a champion for irresistible product. Irresistible product across all of our brands. And that includes Juicy Couture and Lucky Brand Jeans and Kate Spade and Narcisa Rodriguez and, and GKNY Jeans, as well as Liz Claiborne. Um, and what I've realized, it, this has been a huge, incredible learning curve for me, and it's exhilarating and it's still a little terrifying. But what I've realized is it's not just about the design. I mean, we, ha we have incredibly talented designers. They can create the most irresistible product in their studio. It's about sourcing, supply chain, production, marketing. What do the stores buy? Um, I mean, so much of what we do is wholesale. So it's a matter of what, what do the buyers come in and actually purchase from the showroom? We can be celebrating everything in there, but if it's not going out, mm -hmm. who cares? So it's, it's, a, it's an extremely complicated business. It's an extremely fascinating business, and it's an extremely scary business in many ways. And I'll say this to anyone who's thinking about going into the um, fashion industry, no one's a solo. This is a huge collaboration. There are so many moving parts, so many people with whom you have to interact successfully, and it's not just on the design side. It's also the retailers. And the relationship with the retailers has to work. And it's a challenge because everybody's, we're, we're all coming at this with a, from a slightly different point of departure and point of view. Mm -hmm. And we have to all become one and the same and, and really synthesize each other's needs and listen to each other. When people ask me what's the most important lesson going into the fashion industry, listen and absorb. It's very important. Hmm. Uh, I was speaking, uh, interviewing a record producer a couple of weeks ago, very uh, successful, He's produced albums with James Taylor, Eric Clapton, uh, Stevie Winwood, and he's still uh, producing for young artists now. And uh, while he still enjoys it, he was uh, opining just a bit in rather loud terms about uh, what American Idol has done to the music industry and maybe a couple of artists who, recording artists who might not be willing to, as in the old days, get in the van and go out and do a hundred shows and, hmm. and, you know, school of hard knocks that because of Idol, albeit incredibly successful, that they just think they're gonna be on TV tomorrow and, that, and that's gonna be it. Understanding what you said about Project Runway earlier, about it, it is, this is what it is and it's not pretty, um, what effect do you think it has had on the industry? And do you think, you, are you seeing any people who are drawn in by the attractiveness of the show who maybe shouldn't be in the industry? Well, the, oh, 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 Bud, that's a good question. I mean, I, I will say this. One, one demonstrable measure of the show is that I can't help but think that there's a corresponding link between the phenomenon of Project Runway and the enrollment growth in fashion design programs across the nation, because it's just a fact, they've grown. If young people are attracted to the industry because of the show, frankly, I'm happy. I mean, I'd much rather have them attracted to the show because of Project Runway than because of Sex in the City, mm -hmm. which I, was also a phenomenon, but it portrayed the industry in a, in a different kind of way. Um, what, I'm, what I thought you were going to ask me is, why haven't the Project Runway designers enjoyed the kind of success that many of the American Idol uh, contestants have? And I met, because I'm asked that frequently. Mm -hmm. And my response is, well, it's not as simple as, not that this is really simple, but, it's, but relatively. It's not as simple as going to Las Vegas, putting your name up on a marquee, and filling a theater with people and singing to them. Um, it is a... Huge collaboration, as I said earlier, about the industry. It's a matter of scale. It's a matter of financial backing. I mean, Christian just won $100,000. Can I be blunt? It's going to blow out of his hands in nanoseconds. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's not a lot of money. Um, 
And it's a matter of, of what do you really want to achieve? Uli Herzner, a uh, wonderful designer from season three. She's the, if any of you saw season three, she was one of the, thank you. <laughs> she's one of the final four. She's in Miami. Uh, Uli and I talk about every three months, and generally speaking, it's the same conversation. There's a fervor for her work. Pe buyers want to buy it. They want it across the nation in department stores, Saks, Neiman's, and she can't deliver the goods unless she lets go of production. She has her hand in everything. So she calls and she laments it. It's like, Uli, let go, <laughs> let go. And she's, I, I believe she will get there eventually, but she's not there yet. At the same time, while she's still in people's minds and while they're still calling her, I think she should be ready to do that. But this is, this is the conundrum that they face. Mm -hmm. What do I do? How do I respond? And it's different for everyone. I mean, I have the greatest respect for Chloe Dow, the winner of season two, the fact that she decided to stay in Houston, expand her business there, um, do a diffusion line for QVC, which she's done three times and very successfully. She's doing it her own way. And is it the way of Michael Kors? No, but she's not Michael Kors. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, it's different for everyone. I remember the story that uh, one of the, in like the first season, or you were in a store, or maybe it was Macy's, and oh. talking about the effect, <laughs> didn't someone mistake you for? We were doing the season two auditions. So, I'm sorry, we were doing the season three auditions uh, at Macy's. They were a sponsor. And there's an Au Bon Pain down on um, 7th Avenue between 34th and 35th. And I was going in there. We had auditions over three days. I was going in for my coffee and a croissant. And the first day I went in, the woman behind the counter started shrieking, oh my God, oh my God, you're from Project Runway. And I said, oh, thank you. I'm glad you've been watching the show. And she said, look, everyone, it's Michael Kors. <laughs> so I didn't correct her. She was so excited about Michael Kors. I didn't want to disappoint her. But the next day when I went in, she said, uh, went through the same thing again, and look, it's Michael Kors, everyone come over. And as I was leaving, <laughs> she took me aside and she said, can I just ask you something? Said, yeah, sure. What happened to your nice tan? <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to tell her. Mm. I didn't want her to think that Michael was sick or wasn't going to the tanning salon. You are a good and decent man. Because <laughs> you could have led her in all different directions. And she was disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> it's lonely at the top. <laughs> all right. How about time for some questions? Let's, I think if we bring up the lights a little bit. Uh, we got a lot of people. Wow. A lot I didn't of realize questions. how many people I will, were here. I will do the best I can. I'm glad I didn't know. Again, please... Uh, Ask, wow. and those people up here, up top, are watching the same show, Tim. My God, yeah, a different Hi. show. Just uh, ask your question as loud as possible, please. Yes, right here in the middle. Um, do you have any Bravo has not said anything yet. I, I will tell you, we're discussing it. We're discussing it. Well, I, I hope so, because I'd love to do it again. Thank you very much for asking. I would hmm. love to. We have to do things differently, though, because no one will be surprised. And I promise you, if anyone of you have seen, seen it, I'm going to lose my voice now. Maybe it's Bravo sending a, a hmm. vibe. No underwear drawer this time. I refuse to do that again. <laughs> yes to the underwear lesson, no to the underwear drawer. It's too humiliating. It's my favorite part. <laughs> yes, in the corner, please. I can assure you no one is protected, including me. And I have to tell you something. When we were doing the season four auditions, who's on the show was determined by the auditions. And we had the most experienced group of designers ever turn up for, for this season. Um, incredibly palpable point of view, um, deft execution, and who, know, who knew? I mean, it could have, it, 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 who knew? So, we have a pre-screening process so that the, I have worked with three fellow judges so that we do, I mean, otherwise we'd still be doing the auditions for season <laughs> four, let me tell you, we would be. Um, 
because there, we, there are just way too many people who show up. So they screen out, well, you can imagine what they screen out. <laughs> so we had seen really no one who was an about to be design school grad because they weren't going to be able to compete successfully with these other people. So they were being weeded out. And suddenly I see the paperwork of Christian Siriano. He's about to graduate from design school. He's just 21. And what is this, producers? Why is this guy coming in here? And they said, well, he passed through the pre-screening process, so there must have been something about him. So he was in the room for about 10 seconds. I turned to my fellow judges and I just said, this is an old soul. Mm -hmm. This is not a 21-year-old kid. His work totally blew me away. So he ended up on the show, and, and I have to tell you, once you make the decision to have a Rami Cashew on the show, lots of experience, you can't, you've got to have a, a, you have to have as even playing field as you can, or else Rami wins all the challenges, Rami wins, Rami is the next winner of Project Runway, you know, would be, as an audience, ho-hum, we're mm. sick of that. So th th there has to be, an, it has to be an even playing field, and the aspect of season four that I hadn't anticipated, well, I sort of did, but you don't never know until it starts happening what's really going to happen. What I hadn't really anticipated was how different the dialogue in the workroom would become in terms of my interaction with the designers. It was no longer about clip off those threads and fix that hem and why is that sleeve set in so poorly into the bodice. I mean, there were those moments, think sweepy. Um, whom I love, I love Sweet Pea. Um, but it was really about design content. And even more than that, it was about how well does this particular design solve the challenge. So it was a very, very different kind of relationship and one, frankly, that I loved. But I will add, the reason I'm giving this build up is because because the work was so well executed and because the point of view of the design was so strong, I never knew going into any challenge who was going to win and who was going to be out. The prior three seasons, I had a pretty good idea, with mm -hmm. some exceptions. This season, never. So we really didn't know. So Christian was not protected and frankly, the reason that I gave him that big pep talk during the prom dress challenge was because I could see him giving up. I could see him just letting go, and that's why I said, you are too talented, you cannot do this. Rally, rally. <laughs> and he did. Way up top, Hi. up top, right over here in the, in the white shirt, yes. If, if Chris had uh, gotten rid of the human hair, did everyone agree with me about that hair? <laughs> oh. I even said to him, you know, if it were synthetic, I'd have a different feeling about it, but it's real. And he said to me, well, you know, people wear wigs, yeah, but not on your clothes. Um, I have to tell you, there was a moment in the, uh, um, I don't want to call it an interrogation, but, but in, in, when the judges were, were um, questioning uh, Rami and Chris, there was a moment that's not in the show. Um, th there's so much that happens. And, there, and the show can only be 44 minutes long, um, and, and I never know what's going to be edited in and edited out, but there was a moment that I wish had been in the show because for me, it was the moment when I knew it was Rami and not Chris, and I'll tell you what happened. The judges asked each of them, who's your client? And Rami answered articulately and believably and very thoughtfully. You, know, you knew Rami knows his client. He knows who's going to wear these clothes, and Chris answered, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. And it underscored for me the fact that he, in his core, he really is a costume designer. His, his customer's changing all the time, and he's not thinking fashion-wise about having a client. Because at Parsons, whenever I had a student who was struggling or derailed, I'd ask him or her, who's the client? And invariably, they couldn't answer. And I'd say, that's your issue, until you can until you can determine who that client is, you're not gonna get yourself out of this rut. So that was the moment for me. And I have to say, I, I really loved many aspects of Chris's collection, um, with the exception of the human hair. Hmm. Uh, yes, right in the middle, in the green, yes. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're, you were up.
Hi. You're talking about your own personal look, or you're talking about professionally? Oh, your, so your own personal dress. Yeah, I mean, I, I, because I, I thought you were talking about how to transition from student, student world to being in the real industry world. Well, are you a student here in New York? Internships, internships, internships. Have as many as you can. Um, every company in this industry has a different culture and feels different. Um, when, whenever I, a student makes a, an assessment about the fashion industry based on one internship, I say, go have another one. You're going to have a very different kind of experience, particularly if their first experience is not a good one. Um, because there's, I really believe there's a place for everyone out there. In terms of how you present yourself to the world, this is something we really haven't even talked about, bud. Um, <laughs> how much time does everyone have? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I really believe in the semiology of, of clothing, the fact that our clothes send a message about how we are perceived, and we all need to own responsibility for that. And when you're a student, you can get away with a lot of creative license and latitude. And when you're out in the professional world, you really need to assess with whom you interact, with whom do you re or to whom do you report, um, what are the expectations of you, and how well prepared are you for that. Um, and it starts with an interview, and I always, I always tell my students, dress up for that interview. Dress beyond where you think the expectation is, because at least you can then bring it down. And, and whoever's meeting with you will, will believe, and rightfully so, that you've been thoughtful about your manner of presentation and respectful. There's nothing more unsettling, or a few things as more unsettling, than, being, than, than dressing lower than the bar of expectation because you figure, I just lost that job. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yes, You're welcome. Right on the aisle here. No, I, I'll, I'm glad you asked the question. That disclaimer is there. Boy, everybody pays attention to that disclaimer. Hmm. I will tell you with absolute impunity, because I'm there, I'm in the back of that room in the literal and metaphorical dark, um, <laughs> because I see the interaction of the judges, and I don't interact with them. They know nothing from me about what was going on, and sometimes I'd really like to tell them. Hmm. Um, the producers step in when there is either a stalemate or some sort of impasse to facilitate a dialogue, but trust me, they never make a decision because if they did, there are some people who wouldn't have gone home when they went home. I mean, would we have ever, if you saw season three, would we have ever lost Milan Breton in the second episode? Never. What, talk about a character you want to keep up through the whole show, but he was gone. <laughs> um, and this season, I mean, you may not even remember him, Marion, who was also gone episode two, Simone. I mean, there were so many really great people. Uh, we would have loved to have kept on, and then there were others. Mm. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, we, they would have been gone earlier. So, and I would think, what's wrong with these crack smoking judges? Now we're getting to the good stuff. <laughs> yes, right here in the middle. Yes. Hi. Fortunately, I ha really have never been a, in a position where I've had to feel compromised. And I have to say, I have such respect for people. And, and when you think about guide to style, since it's not an intervention, this is someone calling out for help. How could you, I mean, other, well, let me, do, let me finish my thought. How could you be mean and disrespectful? I mean, I'm speaking, to, I'm asking myself this question. I couldn't be. The one thing I will say is that I, 
am a truth teller, and I do believe I deliver things with tough love, and there are times when, especially if someone's at a serious impasse, they need a little bit of shock treatment, but it's not about, it's, I'm not attacking their character or their core, their soul, I'm, 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 I'm talking about their wardrobe. Um, and there are times when I feel like I'm a little too pointed, but it, some things really need to be said. And on Project Runway, I mean, this comes from years of teaching. I, I've found out quickly with students that if you aren't respectful of what they're doing, they discredit you immediately. You have nothing, th you have nothing to offer me. I'm not going to listen to you ever again. Um, it's important to channel with them, kind of get into their psyche and understand what they're trying to achieve and then help them do that as well as they can. And in the case of Project Runway, since many times we only have I know, 12, 14 hours for a challenge, I can't mince words. I mean, there's no time. I can't say, well, let's see what it looks like 10 hours from now. Maybe they'll get it. It's like, I want you to think about this now. You don't have to do it, but think about it. And, and I never, feel they need to do whatever it is I say, I suggest. I just want them to have their brains wrapped around the issue in case Heidi or Michael or Nina or our guest judge ask them on the runway. Um, so at least it's not coming totally from left field. And in the case of Guide to Style, as long as our subject understands that she's responsible for how she dresses, that she needs to own responsibility for that, as far as I'm concerned, she really can wear whatever she wants. At least she knows she's making a conscious decision. And she also knows what she looks best in. So it's up to her. I'm not gonna be fashion police. Hmm. But I, I will tell you on the topic of, of um, are you ever asked to do something that you don't wanna do? The answer to that is yes, and I'll tell you what it is, it's styling. Um, in fact, m m the most recent time I've been asked was for The Biggest Loser, and actually the show will air next week. I did it, but I told the producer I wouldn't do it the way the producer wanted it done, which was send me to um, Macy's West, fill a rack with clothes, bring them to the ranch, and tell each of the um, individuals, you wear this, you wear this, you wear this. And I said, I, I, won't, I can't do it that way, and if that's really how you want it done, you're you don't want me because I won't do the, I, I, I won't be good at it. I need to be with them on the floor in the store and see what they resonate to and really work with them individually about okay, you like this kind of look, you like these colors, you like these patterns. Let's let's look at which silhouettes look best on you. Let's put these clothes on and let's have this experience together. And we had an I would just will tell you I had the most incredible time with those six individuals. It was phenomenal. Mm. But I will also add, I was expecting that the women would be really difficult and the men would be a piece of cake. It was the opposite. <laughs> Those men were intractable. I mean, it was just, I kept saying to them, it's only a pair of pants, put it on. <laughs> but they, they were great. And they each had an epiphany. It was wonderful. Hmm. We'll take a few more. Yes, uh, yes, right there in the middle. Yes. Hi. Can I tell you how I really feel? Hmm. I really feel there are only two schools of fashion design in this nation, and it's FIT and Parsons. Yeah, there you go. And without those two schools, there would not be a fashion industry. And, and FIT and, Par and Parsons come to, come to it from different points of departure, and FIT and Parsons grads work with each other throughout this industry. So bravo to both schools. Okay. Yes, right here up front. Loud. I just wanted to say that I think you're incredibly articulate, and I think that's important um, when judging other fashion. And I think Thank you. 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 Could you hear that? Whether, whether I mean, I, I believe in the um, strength and efficacy of, of America looking at fashion through a lens of commerce. I think it's a good thing. Um, does it inhibit, restrict creativity? The Europeans would say yes. I was at a conference in Copenhagen about four years ago, and I was the only person from an American school. 
and I thought I was going to be chased out of Copenhagen with torches. <laughs> um, they had, they said, what you do in that country is so horrible, and those, those designers need a blank canvas. And I, my response was, what challenge is the blank canvas? When you have a problem to solve, and there are all sorts of constraints placed on that problem, you have to be more creative than ever. You really do. You have to be more creative. And also, I have to tell you, I really believe in wearable clothes. I really do believe in them. Um, how many people really want to navigate the world looking like a float in a parade? <laughs> I don't think we do. And here in New York, we don't have room in our closets. <laughs> so I, 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 I love American fashion. Yes, over here in the corner. Okay, um, hi. hi. If my house were really on fire, I would dash out of that house with whatever it is I happen to have on. <laughs> Which in my case, since when I get home, I disrobe would be my pajamas and my robe and my slippers. It's not a t-shirt in there. <laughs> I'm 73. Oh, it could be a pajama bottom and a t-shirt. There you go. Right over here, yes. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Who thinks up the challenges for, on Project Runway? It is the only case that I know where design by a big committee really works. There are about 30 voices in it. We're constantly playing what if and second guessing. Um, and it, it's, it's a good process. In the end, you, I mean, well, you know, I believe so wholeheartedly in the talent of, of the designers, and, and, I'm, and this holds true for every season. We could give them almost anything, and they would come up with something that's really interesting and, and wowable. Hmm. That's a technical term, right? Yes, wow. wowable is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the wow I didn't factor. go to FIT or Parsons, but I believe <laughs> wowable. Uh, yes, right there in the middle. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Hmm. Oh, that's a profound and powerful question, and, and it's, it's not an easy topic by any means. Um, and I'll give you an anecdote. Michael Volbrocht, who designed the Bill Blass line up until a year ago, um, designed it for several years. And when he came to Bill Blass, he said, these are... These are not size two runway models who wear Bill Blass's clothes. They're, they're, they're mature women, they have real shapes, and I'm going to do a fashion show with the real women. Not only was he excoriated by the press, but the custom, his clients sitting in first row hated the show. They didn't want to see those clothes on women who looked like them, which I found both shocking and sobering in a way. Um, Diane von Furstenberg, who's now the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, is, is a leading voice in helping restore uh, a sense of, well, health and um, ethics when it comes to the ages of these models. I mean, part of the issue, part of what, what we're now into with, with models during Fashion Week is that they're not even out of, I mean, I'm going to be blunt, they're not out of puberty. So they haven't really even fully developed, and they're going down the runway like that. And it's when you see a model whose knee, the, the, whose knee has a circumference wider than her thigh, it is not pretty. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's simply, it's not attractive. And it's a scary thing. And I, I have to say, too, I've been quick, too quick recently to blame the modeling agencies and say, well, what are the designers going to do? Those modeling agencies are hiring these girls. It's, it's across the board everybody's responsibility. It really, and we have, to, we have to be better at it. However, I want to add, I don't believe we need to go the way of Spain and start having everybody weigh in. I mean, it's like wrestling, you know, you have the lightweight, the middleweight, the featherweight, the heavyweight. Um, <laughs> we just need to approach this reasonably and with a, a, a serious uh, mind towards 
what's the healthy thing to do. And, and, and these people are, are role models as well. Can I say one other thing about on the topic of role models? Going back to Project Runway just for a minute, because I, I think it's important to say, and it's something I didn't think of on my own. It's something that a mother said to me in an airport. And I won't give you the whole full-flung full flung story, but she said, basically she challenged me to tell her why it is that she and her nine-year-old daughter watch the show and why she loves the fact that her nine-year-old lo watches the show and loves it. Anyway, I'll cut to the chase. She told me why, and it was something I'd never heard before. <laughs> she said, I love the fact that this show teaches qualities of character. It teaches you that working hard pays off. It teaches you that cheaters never prosper. It teaches you that it's better to play nicely with others. And these are, these are just a few examples. And I thought, wow, I'd never considered it that way. But you know, all those old morality tales, they hold true on Project Runway. They really do, they hold up. Um, and it's a good, it's a good in addition to, to this wonderful creative process and getting people excited about the industry, and uh, to say, it's what I said earlier about, about it's daunting, it's gritty, it's hard work, mm -hmm. and that that hard work will get you to the top. It will help get you there. You're, you're not going to get there by sloughing off or by stealing somebody else's work or by just being a pretty face in the room. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen because of hard work, playing nicely with others, and um, being straight and above board, being a straight shooter. Hmm. Let's take a couple more. Let's see up top in the first row. Yes. Hi. No time. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that, that structurally you won't know, but maybe you figured it out. It looks like we judge the runway, somebody goes home, I mean somebody wins, somebody goes home, the designers go back to their apartment, and the next morning Heidi presents the challenge. That's actually not the way it happens. We do the judging, somebody wins, somebody goes home, it's probably about 10, 30, 11 at night, Heidi and the designers have to go off and change clothes into what they'll be, so it looks like they're coming back for the next day, but in fact it's probably 12.30 or 1 o'clock and they're taping that segment about here's your next challenge. And it's rarely, I think maybe only three times a season, when I have to step into that scene also. Usually the designers go home to bed, I meet them the next morning early, and then we go, we go over the challenge again and go shopping. So there really is no time. Hmm. None. Yes, up top, yes, in the hat, I believe. That's you. Hi. Well, we can't have a fashion industry without you business and design people. I mean, it's, it's impossible. It's, it, you're, you're as critical to this as, as the designers um, and the merchandisers. And I mean, as I said earlier, it's a big collaboration. You can't take one function out of it and have it continue to work. It doesn't. Um, are you doing an internship? Yeah. Where are you working? Oh, wonderful. Great. Um, I mean, your role in this industry is as important and as critical as anyone else's. Just go at it with the same passion and drive and determination and create your own path. Hmm. Let's do one more question, and I'm sorry we can't get to everyone. All the way in the back, in the middle. Yes, no, yes, you. Touchdown, yes. <laughs> You know, <laughs> recently, in the last year, I felt like I'm a hair shy of a psychotic breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. And that book almost killed me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, lo I'm, I love having a Library of Congress catalog number. I can't tell you how much. <laughs> if I ever get a tattoo, that's what it will be. <laughs> But trust me, Liz Claiborne is more than a full-time job, and we're going to be taping Runway, and who knows about Guide to Style, but I think it's going to happen, and I am, I, I, I have, well, I have, I have a few pages for a book, but that's about as, as, as um, far as I go. No, the, the book was, any of you out there who've written a book, my hat's off to you. Mm -hmm. Any of you out there who are thinking about writing a book, don't. Mm. <laughs> Beautifully put. <laughs> 
a couple more before we wrap up uh, from me. You are a <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yes, sorry, yeah. bud. <laughs> I, hey, All yours comes with it. Comes with the job. <laughs> Uh, you are a wonderful storyteller. Thank you. Is there any chance you might tell the Vivian Vance story? Oh, <laughs> I'd love to. Does everyone know who Vivian Vance you know who is? Vivian Vance is? The neighbor, the actress who played the neighbor on I Love Lucy. Ethel Mertz. Ethel Mertz. All right. This goes back to the FBI, believe it or not. My father and his relationship with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover died in 1972 at home in his sleep. And it was during the, um, uh, Watergate was about to explode into this huge scandal. So don't think, I don't think there might have been some hanky-panky. <laughs> um, because Hoover would not have protected Nixon. At any rate, my father left the Bureau after that. So he left the Bureau and um, about eight years later, this all this stuff started to come out about Hoover and cross-dressing and his relationship with Clyde Tolson, who was also an agent. And my father at the time was very sick with Alzheimer's disease and he was out of it. So I thought, said to my mother, thank God. It's the only time I ever said, thank God he has the disease because I said if he were cogent, this would have killed him hmm. um, because he was such a macho guy and it's like, that couldn't have happened. Um, and who knows in people's lives. So we were having... Thanksgiving dinner, and my mother was hosting, and my sister and her family were there, and all this stuff had just come out. And I said to my sister, do you remember when we visited Dad in his office, and he asked us whether we wanted to meet Vivian Vance? And she said, yeah. I said, and he said that Vivian Vance was visiting the director. Well, upon reflection, do you remember that only Vivian Vance was in the director's office? <laughs> And think about it. J. Edgar Hoover, Vivian, Ethel Mertz. Think about it. So I said to my sister, our father was a big enabler. <laughs> I will never watch I Love Lucy the same way again. <laughs> One last thing. This has all happened in terms of the national attention after you were 50. After I turned 50, isn't yeah. it phenomenal? It's, I mean, yeah. The fact that you had such influence behind the scenes before that, and then by happenstance, or by the, the power of your appeal in, the, in this meeting with the Project Runway people, it comes about. How, or for whatever reason, <laughs> I'll be quiet. it came about. It at happen. this stage of your life, are you at all reflective about, does that have some meaning for you, that it happened at this point of your life, uh, after so many years working in academia? Well, but I mean, I, I said earlier, I'm, I think I said earlier, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I pinch myself every day. I, I, I do. I mean, I, I, this is why I go back to a painful childhood, um, and, oh, other things that happened. I mean, the, the, the fact that I moved to New York came out of a horrible kind of life crisis in Washington, and I thought, I need, I need to leave this behind me. And the way I was running. And whenever I reflect and think about things that perhaps I would, wanted, would have wanted to change, I, I can't change anything, because they all cumulatively help bring me to where I am. And I'm ecstatic about where I am. I mean, I'm just, I, 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 I'm ecstatic. It's surreal for me. I just can't quite wrap my brain around all of it. And I, I, I could never have anticipated it. I, I have to say, I revel in the moment, and I think constantly, this may be it. I mean, this, and, and, and I'd be perfectly happy. I mean, because look at all that's happened, and, and um, it, it is phenomenal. But, but I will also share with you that when this first began, um, with season one, my mother would say to me repeatedly, regularly, it's your 15 minutes of fame, and the 15 <laughs> minutes is counting. <laughs> and then about a year after that, she started saying, 
Why is it that I picked up People's Style Watch and Nina Garcia was, was reviewing skating costumes and you weren't? <laughs> and now I'll say things like, well, you may want to pick up a copy of Newsweek. There's a nice article. And she'll say, ask, is there a picture? <laughs> so she, she, in many ways, is my whole barometric gauge of this. Um, it's, it's very funny. But it, and and it is, it's, it's totally surreal. And it's totally fabulous. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Well, I think there is a, uh, absolutely. Thank you. I think there is a common decency that comes across for you on both of those shows. And I do not think you can put a price on bringing happiness into people's lives. And for those two things, we thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.